Hello, everyone. Thank you very much for joining us for this webinar. My name is Dustin Saldariaga, and I'm an associate at Scott Legal PC. If you're here today, you likely have an E2 visa or are at least considering an E2 visa, and you're in good company. Uh, this firm was actually founded on an E2 visa about eight years ago. Uh, our firm has a focus on investor visas and has processed hundreds of E2 visas. We've also helped some of our clients move from an E2 visa to a green card, uh, which leads us to the topic we plan to discuss today. During this webinar, we are going to spend some time speaking about the various green card options that are available to individuals who are on an E2 visa. Uh, a few things before we get started. This webinar is actually part of a series that we will be continuing by doing at least two webinars per month on a, a variety of immigration topics. We have webinars scheduled out to February, and we will regularly be adding more. At the end of this webinar, we will send you all a few things. First, we'll send you the PowerPoint from the presentation. We will send a link where you can sign up for the additional webinars that I mentioned a minute ago. And finally, because this webinar is being recorded, we will be sending you a link where you can get the recording to this presentation. So today we're lucky to have Ian Scott here to speak with us. Ian is the founder of Scott Legal, and he has a vast amount of experience processing E2 visas and the various green cards that we'll be discussing today. Again, my name is Dustin. I'll be the moderator for this meeting. A couple of housekeeping items. If you have a question, please send it to me through the Q&A or the chat box on uh, the Zoom uh, software. We will be re responding to questions throughout the presentation, uh, and we have also received a number of questions in advance, and we'll be getting to those as well. We also plan to reserve 15 minutes at the end of the presentation for questions. So without further ado, to kick everything off, I have a question for you, Ian. The question is, does an E2 visa lead to a green card? Excellent question, Dustin. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dustin. And as Dustin mentioned, my name is Ian Scott, and I'm the founder of Scott Legal. And um, as Dustin also mentioned, uh, the firm was founded on an E2 visa, and I myself am actually on an E2 visa in the US, so, so, so can certainly empathize with you. Um, so Dustin's question, does an E2 visa lead to a green card? It's a question that we often get because a lot of countries have systems where you get a visa and that visa ultimately leads to some type of permanent residency. But unfortunately, the short answer to this question is no, an E2 visa does not lead to a green card. And I want to expand on that a little bit and really kind of describe the green card system in the United States. So unlike other, some other countries, some other countries have a system where for example, a points-based system where maybe you speak the language, you have a certain education, a certain age, et cetera, and that all, that all of those things give you points, and enough points will get you permanent residency. But in the United States, that's not the way it works. In the United States, there are a list of green card categories, and if you're eligible for them, you can apply for them. If you're not, you can't, and there aren't any visas. So a lot of, there's always kind of this misconception that there are some visas that lead to a green card, but there aren't any visas that lead to a green card in the United States. What happens is you, if you're on a particular visa and there's a green card that you're able to apply for, then you can apply for it. So we take a look at the, at the slide, and it, it breaks down, the first slide kind of breaks down a number of the different green card categories. So we have family-based green card categories, we have employment-based green card categories. Um, within the family-based green card categories, we have an immediate relative category that gives you certain benefits and then a family-based preference category. Within the employment-based categories, and we're going to talk about, these are the green cards that we're going to talk about throughout, throughout this presentation. We have a number of different, uh, different green cards related to employment, and we'll spend some, some time on each of those. Uh, the two that I think that are best suited, because I think what, you know, what we're looking at here are entrepreneurs, E2 investors, and which green card options are available to them. The two I think that we'll spend the most time on are the National Interest Waiver and then the EB-5 program. But, uh, but we will really, the purpose of this presentation is to really cover uh, you know, the majority, if not all, of the green card categories that are really available to somebody on, uh, on, an, E2, uh, on an E2 visa. Great. And Ian, what are the timing considerations that should be considered when applying for a green card while someone's on an E2 visa? 
Yeah, it's a great question because I think that one of the things that when you are on an E2 visa, you always have to remember that an E2 visa is uh, not is is a is what's called a um, a non-immigrant visa, and it's not a, a visa where you have what is called dual intent. So because it's not a dual intent visa, the uh, the 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 E2 you have to be careful when you're applying for a green card. So typically, if when you're let's say a standard situation, someone like myself, I I obtained my E2 visa and the E2 visa was issued for five years. What I have to be careful of is when I apply for the green card. So let's say, for example, I applied for the green card closer to the fourth year of my E2 visa. And I know that the green card is going to take longer than that to be approved. And as a result of that, it might make more sense for me to renew my E2 visa, and then after my E2 visa has been renewed, then to take a look at uh, at applying for the green card. Because when you have to go back and renew your non-immigrant visa, and then you have an immigrant uh, petition pending, and when I say immigrant petition, I mean a green card petition pending, it could be a problem. It's not always a problem, but it could be a problem. So it's a great question. I think that timing considerations really are key because you really do have to plan all of this out in advance. Perfect. So, so so, and this this particular this first category, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on it, the kind of family-based immigration, but I think it's something that you always should be aware of, that this is possible, that it's possible to get a green card through family. Um, and so one way that you can get a green card through family is if you have an immediate relative, and that's, def it's not immediate relative the way we all think of immediate relatives or brothers, sisters, etc. but the government defines it in a particular way. So uh, the an, an immediate relative would be, for example, if you were on an e 2 Visa, and then you met the love of your life and wanted to marry that person and they happen to be a U.S. citizen. Or if you were um, a parent and you had a U.S. citizen uh, child that was 21 years old, then you fall into under the immediate relative category. And that's a great category because there's no wait for the, the, the green card and it's, it's a relatively simple process. And then the family-based categories, these we often get questions about this. I have a brother who's a U.S. citizen. Can I get a green card? And the answer is yes, you can, but it's going to it's going to take a long time. So the the way that the green card system works is that for most categories, there's a certain number of green cards that the government will allocate uh, by country. So, for example, uh, the family-based category related to siblings, a U.S. citizen can sponsor their brother or sister, but it would take them approximately 14 years for them to get the green card. So you can file the petition now. It could be approved in, let's say, a year, but then you would have to wait for, um, you know, for, for quite some time to be able to get the green card. But, it, you know, but it is an option. It is something, something else. Out there to consider um, as we as you know that's that's a perfect example to kind of go to the next bullet point in terms of backlogs <clears throat> and really what you see there are some categories that you have to wait for a long time. Uh, so, you know, the, the, the sibling category is a, is, is a great example, but there are many other family-based categories that have very long waits, five, six, seven years. So sometimes this category is not that, uh, not that practical. In terms of the processing, if you're on an E2 visa and you're in the United States, then one you have kind of you have two options in terms of processing this this family-based visa, and this really is the case with respect to processing all different types of uh, green cards that we're going to talk about. But the one option is that you uh, file paperwork in the United States to do what's called an adjustment of status, and uh, we're going to we're going we're going to go over that in a lot more detail when we talk about some of the other employment-based petitions. So we'll leave that for now. And similarly, the other option that you have when you you're filing a family-based petition is to file a petition at a consulate for the green card. So you would be in the United States, you'd be working on the E2 visa business, and then you would have a petition pending at a consulate. And we're going to we're going to get into that in a little bit more detail because the process of whether you uh, the this, this process of moving to a green card, the decision of whether you do consular processing or you do an employment uh, based green card, it's uh, so a, uh, adjustment of status process is something that you're going to have to face for all of the green card categories. And as I said, we'll, we'll, we'll touch on touch on that in a bit more detail. Great. Ian, a question came in related to the uh, family sponsor. Is 21 the age that children need to be, excuse me, kid, children, meaning the legal term of children, a 28 year old, a 21 year old child, is 21 the age that they need to be to be able to petition for a parent? 
Exactly. Yes, that, that's exactly right. So if you have, a, you know, the situation where, so for example, I have two U.S. citizen children that are seven years old and I'm in the U.S. on an E2 and I would have to wait until they turn 21. And once they turn 21, they could they could uh, sponsor me for a green card. Isn't that great? So, yes, yeah, so that that's exactly right. <laughs> great. Uh, um, the other documents that you file when you can, when you are in the United States and you filed a uh, an, an adjustment of status petition, an I four A five petition, is at the same time whenever you're filing, and this applies to all of the employment based categories as well. Whenever you're filing a, and a I one I four A five petition, you can also file a petition for work authorization and a petition for travel authorization. So there, uh, the, and as I said, we're going to get in that get into that in a little bit more detail. There's often a little bit of strategy associated with that, but um, whenever you're filing an I-485 petition, those are uh, two additional petitions that you're able to, to file. So let's jump into the first employment-based category, and I'm not going to spend a lot of time in this category because it's not one that is often used for entrepreneurs or, or, or people on, on E-2 visas, but, but we have seen it. So this particular category is called an extraordinary ability category. And what it is, it's the, it's in terms of the, the number or alpha numeric, it's an EB1A. And what this particular category is reserved for is people who are at the top of their profession. So you could have a situation where someone is applying under this category just because they're an entrepreneur. And so, for example, let's say somebody that uh, invented some particular type of technology or was there was a tech startup and the, uh, the, the individual um, had some type of patent and, uh, you know, great business idea, but, they, but, you know, but they're, they're applying under the entrepreneur category. This might be a category that uh, is, 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 is good for them. So a novel business idea, this might be a category that might work for them. And in terms of when you're looking at this category, I listed out the criteria. There are nine criteria that the government will take take a look at, and you have to meet a minimum of three of them. Now, what I did when we put together this slide is I highlighted four, four of them, and the four that I highlighted are typically the categories that we see under the entrepreneur category when somebody is applying in this category. So I'll go through a few of them. So for example, evidence that you command a high salary uh, when you look at your peers. So that's going to be an objective category uh, where you're going to look at how much money you've made in the past or you're currently making and you're going to compare it to what others make. So, so that's going to be a fairly objective category. A another one that's often used is evidence of your performance of a leading or critical role in a distinguished organization. That's uh, so that you can look back uh, in the you look back to the past at some of the jobs or positions that you had. Uh, the distinguished organization is something that is very specific. So you have to a prove that the that in the government's mind that the organization is distinguished. So been around for a while, has a, has a great reputation, etc. And then you have to prove that you had a leading role. And often this is done through letters, getting letters from others and or your previous employer to explain that the, uh, the role that you had was a leading role and it was significant to the organization. So that's, that's another category. Sometimes evidence of your original scientific or, or scholarly uh, contribution. So again, the example of a tech startup, even though the person's coming in as an entrepreneur, they may have hired developers, they may have had a great business idea, hired developers to come up with some type of technology that they've patented and the patent shows that it's it's an original idea. But but again, as I said, it's not it's not a category we see that often. Um, and and uh, the, you're going to see why why when we move to the next slide. Um, but then also the, the last one we sometimes see in this category is evidence that you're judging the work of others. So that's, uh, that's uh, sometimes we see, there's one case we had where the person was um, opening a, a chain of different types of businesses and he was asked to serve as a judge to, um, to, to, to kind of review and assess others who were uh, trying to, to obtain similar endeavors. So, so that's, that's, uh, that's um, this particular category. And as I said, it's not used, uh, used that often. The one benefit of this category 
is that uh, you can self-petition. You don't need an employer to sponsor you for this. Uh, so someone that is in the U.S. on an E-2 and, and maybe meet some of this, they can just, you know, they don't need their entity. They don't need anything. They can just, uh, they can just file the petition um, and, uh, and self-petition. The, um, the other kind of consideration with this, this particular category that makes it, again, somewhat difficult one, is that the first step is that we look at whether or not the applicant has met three of the uh, criteria. But then after that, what the government does is they perform a very high level and uh, subjective analysis as to whether or not the applicant rises to the level that they believe is extraordinary. So again, it's a very, very subjective analysis and discretionary one. And it's, it's difficult when, for example, let's say someone objectively meets three of the criteria, but then they move to the second criteria, second uh, assessment, and then the government determines that they, in fact, um, haven't risen to the level because no one, it's a, it's a bit of a black box or a complete black box, uh, and no one really knows, um, uh, you know, exactly how that they make that determination. But a lot of the time, what we like to see as a result is the applicant um, meeting the criterion more than just three of the areas, so that we have more to uh, kind of more things that we can point to as to why they might meet the second uh, second criteria, and then it, then the. Petition that we're going to file here, it's an I-140 petition. So when we looked at the family-based petition, it was an I-130 petition. This one's, it's called an I-140 petition. And then the second part of this is the I-485 uh, petition. If Again, if you are in the United States and you're doing uh, an adjustment of status or consular processing. And again, we're going to talk about those in a little bit more detail as we, as we, as we progress. Ian, one, one question on the EB-1. Um, is, is there an expectation that the individual will continue that work? So for example, if, if someone is of retirement age and has a lifetime of these accomplishments, would, be, would it be appropriate for them to apply for that? No, it wouldn't be because it's a great question because it's actually that's actually a requirement. So, so the part of what we have to indicate in the petition is the person plans to continue this type of work. So normally we can do it just by saying it. <laughs> right. So, so normally we can do that. But I think that in the example that you gave, Dustin, or the, the, the question that was raised, if the person was older and the, um, there was a question as, whether, as to whether or not they plan to continue and or there was a question that they plan to continue, that would be a problem for this petition. Perfect. So now we're going to move to national interest waiver. And, and Dustin, I know you had a, the, a, a question or someone had sent in a question. And uh, if you could yes, just, uh... absolutely. So so someone is interested in hearing an example uh, of an NIW national interest waiver case that you worked on for an entrepreneur. Perfect. So so we we recently had a case where the individual um, was uh, an engine providing consulting services to engineers. That was the business idea. The person was an engineer. The person had um, a patent. The person had a lot of letters from other prominent engineers saying that the this was an area in the United States that there weren't a lot of people that had his particular skill set. Um, and uh, that that uh, he would be able to, to offer quite a bit of, as a result of this, that he would be able to train other people, that he would be able to create empl employment. Now, this was an interesting case because when we took the case, we had to make the decision as to whether or not we were going to do the national interest waiver just because he was an engineer, because he was an aerospace engineer, just because he was an engineer, or do we want to focus on the entrepreneur piece? And we ended up focusing on the entrepreneur piece, and I'll explain why. Because when we looked at what he planned to do and the business that he planned to start, the, the economic impact or the national interest, and we'll get into the criteria in a second, but the national interest related to the job creation was significant. And we felt that that would be uh, would sway the government more. And when we submitted this petition, we submitted the petition. And you may be familiar with the process when you submit a petition through USCIS. A lot of people that have E2 visas are not familiar with USCIS because they applied at a consulate. But uh, when you submit petitions through USCIS, and this is you know with with the petitions we're talking about, like the 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 EB1 and the National Interest Waiver, they can only be submitted through USCIS. They 
often uh, send you a document and it's called a request for evidence. And the request for evidence can often take us immigration attorneys far longer to answer than the original petition. And, um, but we submitted the petition and they didn't even submit an RFE, they, they approved it. And, and, and as I go through the criteria, I think you'll, you'll understand, uh, I think you'll understand why. Ian, one quick question, and this might be better answered in a minute, but a uh, question came in, is an EB2 appropriate for a legal practice? Yeah, so let me. I'm going to come back to that. I'm, I'm going to. I, I am. I'm, I'm going to come back to that. So, so the answer is it could be. I think it, it. It absolutely could be. But let me. Let me come back to it. Um, and and maybe put some parameters around what would have to happen. Um, so, for example, if I wanted to apply for a uh, a national interest waiver, if I didn't want to wait for my kids to turn 21, if I wanted to apply. <laughs> For a national interest waiver, what would I have to do? And and I definitely have an answer for that. So, so let's run mm -hmm. let's run through the criteria. So, mm -hmm. luck, lucky for us or lucky for entrepreneurs that there was a case that was decided a couple of years ago. And the name of the case it's not important, but Danisar. It was it was a case that in, whenever there's a case, it means that someone applied for the benefit. They were denied. They thought they were eligible. They sued the U.S. government, and then the government came back and said, you know something, you were right. You are eligible. And then they set forth what the criteria should be and they, and it fundamentally changed this particular category and what this particular case did which which over the last two years made it viable for entrepreneurs is in their decision they mentioned entrepreneurs and and and, and it's specific it opened up this category to to entrepreneurs and makes it makes it uh uh, makes makes it accessible to entrepreneurs. So so let's go through the the three prongs or the three things that you have to fulfill. The first one is that um, the the whatever you're whatever it is that you're trying to do your endeavor has to be of national importance. Now the the great thing about this particular prong when you're looking at entrepreneurs often that can be proved through a business plan and the, the business plan and showing that you plan to hire US workers because with entrepreneurs, your argument is, is that the national importance is that you are creating US jobs, right? So that, uh, that is, and again, it's something that didn't exist before, but, um, but, but, but is there now. Now, when you're looking at this though, it's not creating five or maybe not even not even 10 jobs it is because we're talking we're talking national and and even though the the case was very specific that you could just be opening something a business in one particular state for example it doesn't you know, it doesn't have to be a chain that pops up in every state but what you would really be looking at in terms of economic benefit or impact to the economy is, 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 is a large number of employees uh, in terms of the impact. So some of the examples that we went back to before where we said like a tech startup or something like that, and the tech startup is, um, is, is, is something that, you know, you look at all the tech startups in, in the world and the impact, the economic impact and the jobs that those startups have created, um, that is, uh, you know, that certainly a business plan like that would be a business plan that would be very helpful for, uh, for a national interest waiver. But it could be, you know, it, it could be that national interest waiver could be a business with uh, 30, 40, 50 jobs, and possibly even less. And keep in mind that, and as we get, as we go through this, uh, this, this example, keep in mind that these jobs don't have to be created when you apply, right? So, so this is, this is often this particular category, especially for entrepreneurs can be approved. And the case made this very, very clear. This particular category can be approved with a business plan. And, and, and as we move through, uh, move through to the other, other criteria. So jobs is one thing, economic impact is another thing. A lot of the time, like, so for example, when we uh, looked at the example that we started out with, with the, with the aerospace engineer, we, we talked mainly about jobs, but we also talked about the fact that there are very few people that have this particular expertise and, and, and that in itself, like because he's doing things with airplanes, that's going to um, benefit the aerospace industry in the United States. So anything that you can latch on to, and if you can latch on to more than just the entrepreneur, so uh, the, uh, the entrepreneur aspect of cre creating jobs, like looking to see what the person is doing. We're doing another one of these right now for an individual. It's a biotech company. We're doing it under the entrepreneur category, but we're also utilizing what the company is doing when we talk about why it is that uh, this is of national importance. So keep in mind that the person doesn't have, the person isn't the one that has something to do with stem cell or other research, but the person that is applying for the, the national interest waiver 
he himself is not the scientist or the person that's 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 uh, you know kind of um, doing the research, etc. He's the one that founded the company and started the company. But we can utilize all of that to our advantage to say that um, what he his endeavor is of national importance, even though he's not the one specifically you know is specifically doing the work. He's hiring people to do that particular particular work. Um, and as I said, it doesn't have to be, uh, because that was one difference in, in this category from before, is before the, the case that they utilize, the endeavor had to be national. So if, you, if, the, if there was one company in one state, that would never work. But this case made it clear that that was, uh, that that was not, uh, not required. And what we do to prove this particular prong is we get expert letters. And the letters focus on something different from the letters that we often get for the EB-1. The EB1 letters focus on this person is fantastic and there's no one like him or her. The national interest waiver letters focus on this person is fantastic and this is the benefit of what they're doing to the economy. So that's uh, that's the, the focus of those particular particular letters. But uh, but as many of those letters as we can get, if we can get six of them, eight of them, that's uh, you know that's certainly what we would include uh, what we would include in the file. The second uh, criteria and this one is a fairly simple one. Um, the uh, so so and actually before we move to the second criteria, just so I can answer the question with respect to law firm using this as the example. So what would work for a law firm here? So if a law firm planned to create multiple jobs uh, in the United States, that you know that in itself could meet this particular criteria. Um, uh, you know, you would have to you would have to have a business plan. You would have to uh, show the government or prove to the government why it is that you uh, feel that you can create these jobs uh, to the extent that the type of law that you practice is something that you can argue is beneficial to the uh, to 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 the to the to the United States. Um, you know, maybe you're practicing law where you're um, defending the rights of um, lower income people and that might be something that the government or the nation considers important so you you might be able to utilize that so and I, what i'll do is i'll come back to the law firm for each of these criteria so then the second is that the entrepreneur is well positioned to advance the endeavor. So what, what do we look at here? We look at your education. We look at your work experience. So using the law firm, firm example, um, maybe if I, if I looked at myself, I, I say, oh, well, I've been running a law firm for, for eight, nine years, and I, I went to this law school, and I have this experience, and I have this business experience before that. So all of those things uh, you're going to point to uh, to prove that you are actually well positioned to, uh, to advance this particular endeavor. And then the final prong is for entrepreneurs, and this is this is this is fantastic, the um, is a simple one often because the final prong is really getting at the idea that you want to prove to the government that they should waive the labor certification. Now, the reason this is called the national interest waiver is because as you see when we come to the next, next uh, green card, that normally when someone wants to apply for a green card and has a company sponsor them for a green card, they have to go through what's called a labor certification process and they have to prove that they are no qualified US workers and that is quite a process. So what, the, what this third prong is saying is that you have to prove that it's worth the, the it, it makes sense for the government to waive this labor certification process. Now we make a few arguments here. So, so one argument that we make is we come back to the, to, prong one and we often throw in a lot of the same arguments kind of saying that this person is is fantastic they're going to help the u.s economy there's no one else that can do what this person does but then we also use a, a very good argument that was uh, cited in the case as well that has to do with well entrepreneurs are not eligible for labor certification and we'll talk about that in a second when you own the company you're not eligible so you're not competing against anybody and as a result of that um, it makes the labor. It makes the the the, the, the uh, providing the analysis as to why they should waive the labor certification um, uh, a point that is not that relevant to entrepreneurs, right? Because national interest waiver. Keep in mind, it's not just relevant for entrepreneurs. In fact, it's new for entrepreneurs. It's others that normally normally use this category. And and as I said, with the case that we mentioned that we did for the um, the entrepreneur engineer, uh, we we provided very little information under this prong and as i said it was it was it was it was approved and similarly if it was a 
law firm, uh, we, we would do the same thing. We would say that the entrepreneur um, is not uh, eligible for labor certification, so it really doesn't make sense. And then we would point back to some of the things in the, uh, in the, first, uh, in the first prong. So one thing to, a, a few more things about this particular category. So, so, so before you even start <laughs> uh, looking at this particular category, there is a threshold issue. So you'll see at the top of the slide, we say EB2, right? So we, the first one was EB1 and, and, and this is EB2. So EB2 is broken up into two different categories. So EB2 national interest waiver is the first one that we're going to talk about and we'll come to the second one. Now, for the EB2 category, there's a threshold question. Before you get to these complicated aspects of has the person met the national interest waiver requirements, you first have to ask the question, is the person even eligible to apply under the EB2 category? And there are only two types of people who are eligible to apply. Someone who has an advanced degree, and what that means is a master's degree, or someone who has a bachelor's degree and five years of progressive experience. So when you're looking at this category, you have to kind of sit back and you have to say like, so, so let's say somebody has a, a high school degree and they meet every single one of these prongs. Unfortunately, they're out of luck. Uh, they're, they're not eligible for this category. Um, if they have a bachelor's degree, but no experience, and we've seen it, we, we have seen it, a bachelor's degree and no experience. Uh, unfortunately, they're out of luck. They're not eligible for this category. But some, so it's something you have to sit back and look at before. Perfect. Okay, so so let's take a look now at EB2 and EB3 perms. So as I said, EB2 is broken up into two, two pieces, EB2 national interest waiver, and then EB2 perm. And then we've also included here EB3 perm. So what this is getting at is when a company wants to sponsor you for a green card. So when a company wants to sponsor you for a green card, they are either sponsoring you under EB2 or EB3. And the distinction is, as I said before, EB2 is advanced degree or BA plus five years experience. And then EB3 is there are a number of different categories, but it, it, it doesn't require a degree. Um, it, it can be a degree, but then other, other uh, you know, many, many different categories. So, so what we're looking at here, when we're talking about this in terms of E2, someone on an E2, um, this one is a little different because the other two categories, the EB1 and the National Interest Waiver EB2, you could be on an E2 and then you can just say, I'm going to use my existing business and I'm going to apply for this. So I'm going to apply for the National Interest Waiver. I'm not going to change anything in my business. I'm going to, you know, I'm, I'm going to utilize my business to apply for this. But the EB2 and the EB3, you can't do that. So the PERM specifically prohibits uh, business owners, owners to apply to sponsor themselves or their, their immediate family. So you can rule that out if you own a business, if you, if you own 50% of the business and, and you want to sponsor yourself, you can't do it. If you want to sponsor your wife, you can't do it. If you want to sponsor your husband, you can't do it. Your children, you can't do it. It's, it's prohibited under the regulations. So, um, so, but this, what we've done, what we have done for our E2 clients is you have an E2 client um, and then the spouse gets a job because keep in mind the E2 can, the spouses can get a job. So the spouse gets a job and then the company sponsors the spouse. And when the company sponsors the spouse, if you have the, everyone can join, as long as the kids are under 21, everyone can join in that green card petition. So that's something we have done um, uh, for, for E2 clients. So it's something to, something to keep in mind. And, uh, you know, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on the, the process, but, uh, you know, kind of outline the different steps here. There's a PERM process, which is that same labor certification process that we talked about that you don't have to do in the National Interest Waiver, where uh, you have to prove that you can't find a qualified U.S. worker, and then you have to file a I-140 petition, and then you have to file an I-485 petition. Um, and the only other thing you kind of you have to keep in mind, and you have to keep this in mind with, with uh, all of the categories except for EB-1, because that's usually what's called current, is that there are some countries that, um, similar to the way we talked about the sibling petitions, and you have to wait 14 years, there are some countries where you have uh, to wait for a green card. So uh, under the EB3 category, for example, if you were born in China, you would have to wait for a green card under that category. So, so th there, there are lots of, um, there's, there's a, a document, it's called the Visa Bulletin, 
And the Visa Bulletin describes which green card categories are what we call current. So it means that the green card is available at that particular point in time. And both the EB2 and EB3 categories, some of them are not current. So, so a, a good example that I'll, I'll give you is an individual that we did an EB1 petition for. He already had an approved EB2 petition, but he's from India and that was backlogged. So he, he would have to, he would have had to have waited for many years, let's say 10 years to get the green card. So he was eligible under the EB1 category. So we filed the EB1 petition, it was approved and he was able to get his green card because there were green cards available under EB1, but there were not green cards available under EB2. Great, Ian, we have a couple questions sure. that are sure. related to what you've been talking about. Perfect. If a person gets a green card under the EB2 NIW, mm -hmm. um, does their spouse also qualify for a visa? Yes. Perfect. And related question to clarify, do you need to be working for a company before they can sponsor you? And which, which green card were they asked? Well, actually, I can talk about all of them. So, 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 so no. So the green card category. So, so let, and let's kind of back, let's go go through a couple of them. So the national interest waiver category. If you're applying for a green card, you have two options or two ways of doing it. One is you can self petition, which is is great. It's just like the EB one. Or your company can, if you're working for a company, your company can sponsor you. So there, there are kind of two, two ways of doing it. In both of those instances, if you get the green card, your spouse can join and children under 21 can, can, can join. Now, the, the question you just asked, Dustin, comes up much more in the EB2 and EB3 cat, uh, situation. A lot of people think that you have to work for a company for them to sponsor you, and it's it, they don't. You, you, you can never, you could, <laughs> you could be in... In, 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 in Canada, in, in the UK, you could have a company that says, I want to hire uh, Joe or Jenny, and uh, I want to start the green card process for them. They've never stepped a foot, they've never stepped foot even in the United States, and that's no problem. The, the EB2 and EB3 process, they're for prospective jobs, and, the, and what happens normally, the person has worked for the company before, but there's no requirement that, um, that, that someone work for a company when they apply for, um, when, when the company sponsors them for an EB1 or EB2. Great, thanks. No problem. Okay, so let's move to the uh, next um, category. And this is uh, definitely an interesting one. So, so we at the end of November, and we'll kind of explain why, processed the number of these for uh, our E2 clients. And, um, and, and as I said, as we go through it, uh, as, as, as we go through it, um, we'll, we'll, we'll explain why. So EB-5 is a direct, direct investment. Well, EB-5 is broken up into two areas. One, direct investment and regional center. For, the, for our purposes, we're only going to talk about direct investment because we're talking about uh, E-2 to EB-5. I know that someone had sent in some questions about regional center, so we'll answer them. But in terms of what I talk about, we'll, we'll talk about the movement from an E-2 to an EB-5. So let's talk about the EB-5 program. So first, you know, kind of the rules for the EB-5 program changed in November of 2019. And the, there are kind of two main changes, two significant changes. One change was that the investment amount increased. So the investment amount before was, there were two investment amounts, 500,000 and 1 million, and, and now it's increased from to 900,000 and 1.8 million. And so those investment amounts are investment amounts that you invest in something called a new commercial enterprise. And what that's defined as, as an entity that's formed uh, after November 29th, 1990. So even if you were sitting today, uh, you know, if you opened up a business 20 years ago and you said, I, you know, and it was on an E2 and you said, Hey, I want to like, you know, do an e EB5, you could look back 20 years and look at the expenditures that you've made. As long as the business wasn't opened up before November 29th, 1990, you would, you would be able to take a look at that. So the one big change was the dollar amount. Now, the, the difference between the 900000 and the $1.8 million um, had to do with whether or not the business was in what was called a targeted employment area. So what is that? So it's an area that the government designates that is economically depressed. So they have two mechanisms for looking at that. One is they say that an area that uh, where the unemployment rate is 1.5 times the national average, or 
what they call a rural area. So an area in the country and they define what those areas are. So that is what determines whether or not um, a business uh, can, can, you know, can apply under the $900,000 mark or the $1.8 million mark. So um, the other kind of big change with respect to the TEAs was that before November, it really was quite simple to get designation as a TEA because you could just link census without getting into the technical detail you could link census tracts together so even some of the richest areas in manhattan were considered teas but now one of the other changes that they made in november is they said that the federal government has exclusive jurisdiction over um you know making something a, a tea so that that was a big change uh in terms of in terms of in terms of the program so so let's move to talk about a little you know a few things about the investment and i'm going to refer all of these back to uh the e2 so, and and i you know i talk about these to say that if you currently have an e2 and you're considering an eb5 these are all things that we're going to have to consider and so i'm going to touch on them because it's a very very complicated area but i'm going to touch on them but they're all things that you'd have to consider and a lot of them get to the go to uh, speak towards the differences between e2 and eb5 so personal investment. So uh, E2, um, you, when, you, when you're applying for uh, E2, the investment can be your investment. It can be someone else's investment. It can come through an entity. Like, so for example, somebody could set up an a LLC in the UK and they own 100%. And then that LLC could invest in the E2 company. No problem with that. But that is a problem for EB5. EB5 requires your direct investment. So e there have been cases where EB5 cases have been turned down where, let's say, for example, uh, a parent loans a child money to invest in something. And instead of the parent giving the money to the, the uh, let's say, the E2 investor, the parent takes the money and puts the money directly into the business. That 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 in itself, the, they could deny the case for, um, because they would say that you personally haven't invested, um, uh, you know, because the person who gave you the gift or you loaned the money from put the money directly into your bank account. Whereas for E2, that's never a problem. So you, because when you look at the E2, one of the first things that you're going to do is you know, as provided that your business was started after after uh, November 1990, you're going to say, "Well, I want to use what I've what I have, right?" So, so one of the E2 cases that we did um, was was for a farm. An E2 conversion to an EB5 was for a farm. And the person had invested, it was at the time we did it before November, so they only had to invest $500,000. But they had invested, uh, you know, probably initially $200,000 when they first set up the farm. So we had to go back and take a look and make sure that it was them who personally, there are many things we had to look at, but make sure that it was them who personally invested the money um, rather than, uh, you know, the money coming through some other some other route. But, but it's something definitely you have to... Um, have to have to take a look at one thing that's similar with e2 visas the investment can come from you know can be other assets like it can it can be cash but it can be it can be it can be other assets um, the other thing with the investment when you're doing the EB5 is it can be made over time. So let's go back to that farm example. They invested $200,000 initially, and then every few years they invested another 100,000 and they came up to the 500,000. So by the time they came to us, they had not invested money for years. But what we did is we went back and looked to make sure that they had invested $500,000 over the years and, you know, you know, came to that $500,000 point um, to make sure that they'd met the actual uh, 500,000. And again, it's, it would be 900,000 or 1.8 now, but, um, but we, we, we went back and took a look at that, but the investment can be made over time. It doesn't have to be made at once, uh, once at all. The other very important thing, because I think this is a very common misconception with respect to EB-5 cases that we see, is that when you, so like, and maybe I'll talk about it by giving an example. So let's say that this, uh, you know, someone starts an E2 business, started an E2 business uh, five years ago and they invested $200,000 in the business. And then the business did very well. And let's say the business made millions of dollars and there was, you know, a couple million dollars sitting in retained earnings in the business. And then they, you know, person comes and says, well, I want to apply for an EB-5. I have a couple million dollars in retained earnings. Um, and so that means I've invested, you know, I've invested a couple million dollars because I've taken that money and I've, I've it's used it to buy other things in the business, but that doesn't work for 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 EB five. 
the investment has to be your own personal investment. So in order for that to work, you would have to actually take the money that you, let's say you made profit throughout the years, you'd have to pay it to yourself, pay taxes on it, and then reinvest it in the business. So it, it does become, it, it does become quite complicated. Um, but, uh, but, but the, the, when you're looking at coming up to the 900,000 or the 1.8 million, and we have an example we're going to go through as we, as we go through, but when you're looking at that, you, you have to, uh, it has to be personal investment rather than uh, investment that's coming through. Uh, personal investment rather than investment that's coming through uh, the revenue that you're earning for the uh, for for the company. Um, the other thing that you have to be careful of when you're close to the number. So let's say that you are you know you want to invest nine hundred thousand, and let's say you you're adding up the investments that you've made over the year, but you're and then you say okay I've, I've hit the nine hundred thousand dollar mark. That's great. But you have to look, go back and take a look at any bonuses that you've paid to yourself or any salary that you've taken, because the government will, disc, will will subtract that from your investment amount, because any money that you're taking out of the company, and it, it's a particular problem when we see close numbers, any money that you're taking out of the company, the government is going to, uh, the, the government is going to, going to object to, object to that. Um, the... With respect to how you know where the money comes from and how you get it, uh, similar rules in the sense of the EB-5 is going to permit gifts and they're also going to permit loans. The but slightly different, the E-2 visa doesn't focus on them. So the EB-5 is going to make sure if someone gives you a gift, they're going to check to make sure that they pay gift taxes, and if they didn't pay it, they're going to discount the gift. Uh, similarly, the EB-5. I don't want to spend too much time on it, but they they are a little more particular with respect to loans. They they started denying petitions when the loans were unsecured, but then there was litigation that um, that seems to have resolved that uh, resolved that problem. But um, but there's another kind of similar thing with respect to loans is that if there is a loan, the loan can't the the business itself can't be can't be security. Um, another interesting thing with investment in EB-5, and, and let's talk about an example. Uh, so let's say that someone, you know, they, they have a business and they, they, uh, they start a business. So, so let's say you, you know, you have an E2 business and you say, well, I, you know, I just want to start from scratch because this retained earnings thing is confusing and I just want to open a new business. So let's say you have, you know, let's say you're in a TEA area and you, you, you have $900,000 and you take $900,000 and you put it in a bank account. And then you uh, file a petition for EB-5. Doesn't work, unfortunately. The government's not going to consider the money in a bank account as committed. So you're going to. So we we did a restaurant. We had an E2 client, and the E2 client opened up a restaurant, and they spent over uh, the five hundred thousand dollars getting the. Well, they were going to spend over five hundred thousand dollars. So they put the money in the bank. And this we did this again before November. They put the money in in the bank account. And then they had they hadn't spent it all, but they had firm commitment. So they had a commitment with a contractor. They had commitment with employees. They had a, a very expensive commitment for uh, for for a lease. Um, and and that's okay for EB five, but uh, but just putting money in a bank account is not going to not going to be sufficient. Um, EB five in terms of the uh, you know another thing that you do for EB five is a business plan. The business plan is often more extensive than the E two business plan, so we do often have to go back to an E two business plan and and revisit it. Um, and then the final thing, final two things I want to talk about with, with EB-5 is source of funds. So I can't stress enough how, you know, E2, we do very little with respect to source of funds, unless your application was, was through USCIS. Um, but when we go to a consulate, we provide very little information for source of funds. And even the regulations imply that they need very little information. But with EB-5, it is a game changer. They want extensive documentation on everything. And, it's, and they, they treat it as if it's an audit. So, 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 so a lot of the time, when you have an E2 case and you want to move it to EB-5, B5, often you won't be able to use the initial investment that you've made because the source of funds is not traceable to the extent that USCIS would like it traced uh, for EB-5. And it's a very intrusive and extensive requirement. And the final thing I want to just point out, um, uh, it, it, you know, as we move to jobs is there has to be a link towards the investments, investment in a job and the job. So for example, if someone um, invests 
500, like let's say that restaurant that I'm talking about, let's say they invest the $500,000. Um, when you invest the 500,000, let's say that the company had 10 full-time jobs before that, those 10 full-time jobs are not going to count. The the money has to create the job. So it's investment, then creation of jobs. So it's always linking that investment to the creation of uh, creation of jobs. So let's move to jobs very quickly and talk. So the, you know, the other aspect of the EB-5 program is that the EB-5 program, you have to create 10 full-time jobs, not like E2, where it, it's, you know, kind of a general number that we, you know, can change. They have to be full-time, 35 hours a week, no part-time employees, no independent contractors. Um, they have to be green card holders or citizens. Um, and again, keep in mind that it's, it's creating the, and we're going to go through a brief example, but it's creating the jobs, um, you know, after the money has been invested and utilizing that uh, you know that that uh, that particular money, and you must show that you'll be likely to create. And I think one of the questions that came in advance, uh, you must show that you'll be likely to create the jobs within two years after your petition has 2.5 years rather after your petition has been approved. Um, so so that's something something to uh, something to, to to keep in mind. So. Um, so Ian, just sure. sorry to interrupt. I'm, I'm looking at the clock. I know we have 10 minutes left and we actually have gotten a, a number of questions about the EB-5. Perfect. Uh, I think and maybe- Just, just, oh, one, one, just one quick, we, we actually, it goes to 115. So we have 15 minutes still for questions. After. Perfect, perfect. Yeah, perfect, yeah, perfect. Um, so instead of going through, I, I think the uh, scenario, I don't know if you were gonna switch to the scenario, but the scenario will probably address a number of the questions that sure. have come in. Um, so, um, do, do you mind if I dive into oh, that? Yeah, no, absolutely, absolutely, yeah, absolutely, perfect. Yeah. All right, so we have here an EB-5 uh, scenario that'll touch on, like I said, a number of these questions that have come in. Um, we have a client, Helen, who obtained, hypothetical client, Helen, who obtained an E-2 visa in 2015 when she purchased a business for $300,000. The business had f five full-time employees when she purchased the shares. At the end of 2019, she took another $800,000 that was given to her as a gift. The person who gave the gift obtained the money from the sale of a property they inherited 15 years ago. Instead of giving the money to Helen, they deposited it directly into Helen's business bank account. When the money was invested, that's the $800,000, she had 10 full-time employees working at the company. She hired five since she bought the company. At the end of 2019, Helen paid herself a bonus of $100,000 after the company made $1 million. On January 1st, 2020, Helen applied for an EB-5 green card showing a total of $2.1 million invested. And that's the sum of 300,000 in that initial E2 investment plus 800,000 plus a million dollars in retained earnings that the company had made over the years. And Helen also included information that she had created 10 full-time jobs. Helen plans to hire another three or four employees going forward, but is not committed to doing so. So Ian, we have a, a number of questions uh, from this. I guess the, the first place to start is, can this initial $300,000 investment be counted toward the EB-5? Yeah, so it's a it's a great question. It's something I didn't touch on when I went through the EB-5 and, and, and maybe because it's in the case study, but the this is something that's very different from E2. Uh, when someone buys a business with an E2, uh, under an E2, and, uh, you know, pays 300,000, 100,000, whatever amount for it, that's completely fine for an E2. For EB-5, doesn't work. So the 300,000 is completely excluded. The government says that if the person selling the business is getting the 300,000, then that money is not going towards creating jobs. So, so the 300,000 for this is absolutely eh, out. No way to get it in. Related question. Do the five full-time employees that she had when she purchased the business, the E2 business count towards the 10 required for the EB-5? So, 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 no, we're going to say no. There's there's limited circumstances where it could count if the business was a troubled business, et cetera, but it's it's too complicated to go into for now. But so for the purposes of now, just know that the five full-time employees, the ones that were there before, don't count. Great. Uh, we have a gift here. Um, are gifts permitted for purposes of the required EB-5 investment? Yep, gifts are fine, but and just make sure that they've paid the, the, the gift tax because USCIS will look to, to, to check that. 
Perfect. And any other issues you would see in this scenario in terms of the source of the funds or the transfer of funds? Yeah, so the source of the funds, it's just one of those things where, um, you know, to reiterate the point that uh, source of funds is complicated. So they don't, USCIS doesn't care that the person who gave the gift um, inherited the money 15 years ago. They want the or property 15 years ago. They're going to want to see the will. They're going to want to see that the person who either you know, passed away and willed it, um, that they got the money from a legitimate source. So they might want their tax returns. They might want uh, you know, confidential information or, or information related to how they got the funds. So they're, they're very dismissive of time frames or, or, or difficulty of getting information. Um, and, and in this case, the, there would be a requirement that we need a gift letter, but then also we would need to go back and see who gave the money and prove that that came from a legitimate source. Sometimes source of funds documentation can be in the thousands of pages. And a related question, if we look at this 2.1 million total, how much of that can actually count toward the EB-5? Yeah, and I think it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a, the, the eight, probably the 800,000 minus the 100,000. So, so the money, the new money that she, she invested from the, the gift um, and then, but then the government's going to claw back the fact that she paid herself a bonus and also maybe look uh, at the salary. And then if she wants to use any of the uh, 1 million in retained earnings, she has to pay herself, uh, pay taxes on that money and then reinvest that money in the business. Great. A question actually came in a minute ago. Can another company invest or acquire my E2 company? Uh, in order for it to become eligible for an ED, EB-5. So if it were, the company were acquired, the E2 company were acquired for say $2 million, would that make it EB-5 eligible? Yeah, so I think that the, the, the way it's described, I'd say no, because the, um, in order for, because the, the thing that would have to happen is that whoever was investing would have to invest the money in the company. So not pay you, but invest mm -hmm. the money in the company. And then once that person has invested the money in the company, then that person who invested is the only one that's eligible for an e, for an EB-5 visa. Great. Green card, yeah. Perfect. Um, that's actually, you know, we may want to save the, the other questions, allow you to move on a bit. There are a number that I, I was thinking we could save for that final portion at the Excellent. end. No, sounds good. Perfect. Excellent. Great. So, so then we wouldn't, uh, we want to make sure that we're covering all the green card options. So let's look at a few more. Uh, the one here is diversity lottery. And I got to tell you that uh, I know a lot of people who <laughs> want the diversity lottery and a lot of them are our clients. So we have usually one a year that they're E2 clients and then they've applied for the diversity lottery and, and they actually have won. And keep in mind that that your country may not be eligible, but there are rules with respect to, so, so for example, I'm on an E2 and I've applied for the diversity lottery. I'm Canadian, my country's not permitted to apply because we have too many, there are too many Canadians in the US already because that's how they decide um, who can apply. But my spouse is from Antigua and was born in Antigua. And, and, you, and as a result of that, I'm permitted to apply through my spouse. So there are, there are rules and exceptions with respect to the diversity lottery. The instructions are very straightforward. You, to, to do the initial application, you don't need an attorney to do it. You can, you know, if you can follow instructions, you can do it. And um, I'd say that we've done E2 visas for a number of clients that start not E2, diversity lottery when the people have won and then they've had kind of complicated situations, but the initial application. So humanitarian based green cards. So um, this, you know, rare, not not that common. We, we had someone that was on an E2 that, you know, fell out of status and they're, you know, if someone's, if you're here for 10 years and you can look at some type of cancellation and removal and that is a green card so but but it's it's rare but but something to consider other there are a number of different special circumstance green cards like so if you help law enforcement with different things then um th there's a green card that's available for for that um with respect to immigration reform we're very very hopeful that um with a, with the new administration that uh, maybe there will be some type of immigration reform in particular with respect to e2 visas because there was legislation which uh, or bills that, that looked at providing some type of permanent residency for e2 uh, people who had been here for a certain number of years and who had created a certain number of, uh, of, of jobs so so the next um, slide other considerations you know really the, the the one that we touched on one of the first questions that Dustin asked uh, timing considerations and they become very very uh, interesting or important uh, especially when you're looking at EB5 because with an EB5 in terms of filing an EB5 petition 
you are first going to file an I-526 petition. So that's similar to the I-140 or the I-130. And then if you're in the United States, you can do an adjustment of status. Now, uh, you, I couldn't imagine anyone would file one of these on their own. But if you if you did on your I-526 petition, you never, ever, ever indicate that you're doing an adjustment of status um, because it really boxes you into a corner and, and will limit your ability to re-enter even on the E2 or certainly to renew your E2. But you but you know going back to the timing considerations, EB5 petitions take a long time to adjudicate. So usually more than two years. Uh, you know, hopefully that will improve, but that's the the the, the fact right now that they take a long time. So you have to consider that when you have the E2 and you're moving to an EB5. Uh, when we uh, when we, we have an E2 client that applied for uh, an EB5 through a regional center, we'll talk briefly, uh, he, he applied in October and he was applied, approved in February, um, but it was an expedited uh, regional center program. But um, other than that, we have EB, E2 clients that have applied for EB5 that have been waiting for two years, but they're still fine because they can, you know, they're allowed to stay and work on their on their E2. Um, same thing with the country specific quotas. If you if you're doing if you're interested in uh, national interest waiver and you're from India or if you're you know, from China, that you know you have to consider those in terms of the timing uh, to to make sure that you if, if you're in the states that you continue to have status while you while you are in the states. Um, and you know and and because of all of the travel considerations and visa expirations, when you have to renew a visa. Sometimes it's difficult. Um, you know, as I said before, the E2 visa is a is not a dual intent in vi dual intent visa. It's probably as close as you could get to one, but it's not. It's not one. So you really, really do have to be careful when you're uh, changing over to a green card. The parallel green card strategies, uh, there is absolutely no rule or prohibition against applying for multiple green cards. So when we do an EB1 petition, we often do an EB2 national interest waiver at the same time. Uh, someone who's eligible for an EB2 national interest waiver is often very close to an EB1. And we will, will you know, depending on the facts and circumstances, we, we can do that. You can apply for diversity lottery. You can apply for EB5. You can apply for as many different green card categories. And the one that comes through first, you can take it. So, so you, you, you can think about it in terms of, uh, you know, parallel green card strategies. And then, you know, just the whole idea of that planning is really the key here in terms of um, uh, making sure that you are kind of sitting down and, and, and working through, as I said, the renewals and, and what actually is possible, uh, you know, or available. Because sometimes, for example, if someone wants to move towards an EB1, they may meet two of the criteria, but then if they do something else, if they know that judging the work of others is another criteria, they, maybe they can accomplish that over the year so that they're eligible to apply. Similarly, if they're familiar with the National Interest Waiver, then they can uh, maybe do the things that they need to do to make sure that they're able to apply because, uh, because sometimes it is just understanding what it needs to be done can get you, uh, you, know, can get you down, the, down the road. Perfect. Excellent. And that is it in terms of slides. So we can go to questions. Great. So looking forward to 2021, um, can you say a little bit about what you anticipate uh, from the Biden administration for both E2 visas and, and the green card options we discussed? And relatedly, someone asked about the proposed bill that, uh, that I believe has passed the Senate um, that would affect the caps on green cards. Would that yeah. affect uh, family-based green cards as well? And my understanding is that it, it would, but um, but yeah. want to hear yeah. more. No, absolutely. So, so, so in terms of the the Biden administration, so first, first and foremost, E twos were not impacted very much during the Trump administration. There was very little difference in terms of adjudications, uh, t you know, adjudication timing or adjudication in terms of approval. In fact, the E two approval rate for for two thousand and nineteen was through government's statistics was eighty nine percent. Um, ours was closer around 97, 98, but there, you know, 89% is still good. You know, some people apply on their own and it, it was, uh, you know, that was the approval rate. So uh, no, no real significant change there. And even the one big change if, during the Trump administration was that they implemented a whole buy American, hire American, and that was included in the regulations free too, but I don't really see much of a change there. I do, for EB-5, I don't, EB-5 and the other green card categories, the only kind of change I would say that may 
occur is that one of the things that this administration, the Trump administration has done, has um, really slowed down processing, right? So this, this, this backlog, like the two years of EB-5 petitions, for example, that is new, right? So uh, really slow down even, even employment authorization cards. It used to be 90-day guarantee that they would do them. Now it's seven months and no guarantee. So, so that's one change that we're hoping for, that maybe adjudication will speed up in some of these areas. Uh, um, the other change I think that we probably will see is, and this that, this was something that was introduced by this administration actually, is um, the uh, allowing premium processing for some things that we didn't see before. A higher fee, because that the fee's gone up from $1,400 to $2,500. But for example, national interest waivers, you weren't eligible to do premium processing before, where, whereas we anticipate that that's a change that actually is going to occur, where you pay a fee and you're eligible to, 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 to do that. Um, but, but the visas that we've, we've talked about, um, they really weren't the visas that um, came under very harsh attack, the, you know, visas that came under harsh attack were kind of H-1B visas, uh, some of the student categories and things like that, um, but they weren't visas that really, so I, I don't anticipate a, a, a significant change other than processing time. The bill that just came out, I believe that bill just eliminates uh, backlogs on employment-based categories. Um, so, uh, so that's, you know, but that would be a, a, a unbelievable change for many categories. Like for example, the EB-5 category, I believe that Chinese nationals have to wait 13 years. Because there are two things going on with EB-5. One is just the regular processing time, and that's two years. And then if you're from certain countries, then it, there's a backlog. So China has a backlog right now. India may or may not. I'm not sure. I think it goes in and out. But China has a backlog right now, probably over 10 years. So, uh, And then the same thing, that, as we were talking about with the other categories like the national interest waiver or the EB2 and EB3, those EB3 has a lot of backlogs. So th this particular bill is supposed to eliminate all of those um, backlogs, if, you know, if it gets, if it gets signed, if it gets finalized. Yeah. Perfect. Um, going back to the concept of, of company sponsorship in the EB2 and EB3 context, is there any limitation on what kind of company can sponsor someone? For example, could a startup of a, of a US citizen sponsor uh, sorry, of a U.S. citizen sponsor someone. Yeah, so there are there are limitations because the 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 rules are um, complicated, or or there are many of them. I think is part. So, for example, a company has to have the ability to pay. So there's nothing that says a startup can't sponsor someone. Right. There's nothing that says that, but there are rules that say that the company has to have the ability to pay, a demonstrated ability to pay, um, and they may scrutinize a company like that more, right? Because the the you, when you when you're proving that the uh, you couldn't find any U.S. workers, that has to go to the Department of Labor, et cetera. But no, there's no there's no prohibition against it. It's you know, and assuming that the person doesn't have any owner, the person who's being sponsored doesn't have any ownership interest in the company. But it's it's not a um, like, like I would say that it's not a an easy process. Like, so for example, the rules that like even when you're hiring someone, there are specific salaries that you're required to pay them. Like, it's not just I want to sponsor someone and I can just pay whatever, right? You have to go to the Department of Labor and there's specific guidelines and rules of how much you have to pay them. And then that then that goes back to looking at the ability to pay. So, Great. And we actually have a number of E2 specific questions. Um, so slightly, slightly shifting to that, unless there was anything else you wanted to add so, on the, so the green only, card. Yeah, the only one I would wanted to, because I know that someone had sent in questions about um, EB-5, I think, and I just want to make sure we cover those. Um, mm -hmm. I think someone who had sent in... Mm -mm. Were, were they the ones beforehand? They were beforehand, yeah, exactly. exactly. Oh, sure. Yep. Okay, sure. So could you say a little bit about regional centers? Um, what are the pros and cons to pursuing an EB-5 through an, uh, a regional center? And is that a risky proposition? Sure. And uh, so I'll very briefly talk about that just because mm -hmm. it, it goes a little bit. But yeah, so it, you know, I think that regional centers are for people who want to invest in, a, you know, a passive investment. So a regional center is something that, um, you know, there, someone's building a big hotel and you invest $900,000 and they create the jobs and they come back to you several years later. It's an investment like any other investment. So risk, risky. I think that the EB-5 Direct is for people who actually do want to control their own destiny and control their own business. So I think a little more suited to E2. But we, as I said, we have done E2s who say, you know, I just want to, I'll continue running my E2, but I want to want to invest uh, in a regional center because I definitely want the green card. Um, creating 10 jobs is too difficult for me. So. 
Perfect. And, and Ian, I don't know if there were specific questions that we got in advance that you wanted to address. Two of them are very similar, if you wanted to respond to them, which, which are, what are the implications? If I'm going to renew my E2 visa and I have a, a pending or an approved, either an I-526 for an EB-5 or an I-485, what are the implications for the renewal of my E2 visa? Yeah, it's a great it's a great question. It's one that comes up a lot. So and they're and they're different answers. So so let's say someone has a pending I five two six. So we've renewed E two visas with pending I five two sixes with no problem. So we you have to address it, right? And that's why it goes back to when I say on your five two six when they ask, do you plan on adjusting status or <laughs> do you plan on doing consular processing? We always tick tick the box consular processing because our argument in that case is, well, you can renew the E two visa because the plan is to return to the consulate to get the green card. And um, that works, that usually works. We've even, someone had, we had a client who had an I-526 petition pending and we were even able to get them a B visa approved, which is, is you know, which is much higher standard with respect to tie, ties to home country. So uh, the I-485 is a different question. So few things with the I-485. So, so one, if you file an I-485 and you're not on certain visa types, you can't travel until you have a, uh, work, uh, travel authorization card, right? So, so now if you if you had an I four eight five pending, um, you wouldn't be able to renew your your E two, right? So even if you were outside that seven month period and you said, okay, well I want to like, you know, and nor would I think nor would you need to, right? Because if you have an I four I four eight five pending and you had uh, the ability to travel, that means you could return to the US and it also means you could work when you returned because when you apply for the travel authorization, you would also apply for the ability to work and they both, they'd both come at the same time. So, so you wouldn't really need it, but I think it's something to uh, keep in mind that a lot of the time, so for example, when you look at some of the other petitions like the I, the National Interest Waiver and the um, petition for the EB-1, a lot of the time if we think that the case is not as strong, we will only file the I-140 at first because the I-485 can be filed concurrently. But when you file an I-485, it's an absolute indication that you plan on adjusting status in the US. So we file the I-140 first, and then once that's approved, then we file the I-485. Just because the, the filing of an I-485 is an absolute uh, manifestation that you plan to adjust status. So that will make any future and or current renewals very difficult. Great. And there was an additional question about the conditional nature of the EB-5. So if the EB-5 business and the 10 jobs would only be sustained for two years, so before the conditional visa becomes available, what would happen then? Yeah, so so it's it's a it's a difficult question to answer because with um, with businesses and regional centers, it's never as clear as like you know okay, well we hired ten on January first, and then two years later there were ten or whatever. People are coming and going, so when you when you go to re so I'll just answer it to say that when you go to remove the conditions you're going to look back at what has happened sometimes even at the time you're removing the conditions there won't be 10 employees there and it is a calculation process that you're doing when you're close it is a, if, if you're not close it doesn't matter if you're way over it doesn't matter but it is a calculation pr process that you're doing and if you are close then you know you run more of the risk that that they may not approve it but but it is it is a it is a difficult and complicated process to do that calculation Great. Um, so it, it, did you did you want to switch over to those E2 yeah, sure. questions yeah, I mentioned? Yeah, perfect, okay. Yeah, perfect, yeah. So one question, is it better to own a business before applying for an E2 or to start with a business plan and show you're getting a business off the ground? So I think that... Um, you know, the majority of E2s that we do are E2 startups. So people who start with a business plan and are, you know, st set up an entity, start with a business plan. I think that th the question of what is better, it's, it's, it's just fact, it's so fact specific, right? So, mm -hmm. so I, I think that, that the more you have to prove the E2 visa requirements uh, or to support the E2 visa requirements, then both scenarios could, could work if, if, you know, like, let's say you don't have uh, you know, invest, investment enough to, to, to apply for the E2, then maybe you want to wait and kind of, you know, get more of an, get more of an investment. But I think, I think it is very, very fact specific. I know it's not a, that comprehensive of an answer, but it's, it's, it's too general of a question, I think. Mm -hmm. If you were to buy a business for an E2 visa, do you need to pay for it in cash or can you finance a portion of the amount? 
so, so yeah so so you you can have a loan um, but the loan cannot be the business cannot be the uh, security for the loan so it can be an unsecured loan you can have personal security but you the business cannot be security so someone who for example wants to start a motel and they buy a motel from a seller and the seller provides seller financing that clearly the seller is going to say if you don't pay me I want the motel back that mm -hmm. wouldn't qualify but if the person went to a bank their own bank and said um, I would like a loan and I, you know me, so don't take any security or, you know, me and my house is security, then that would work. Great. Uh, we actually got a question from a UK citizen. Must I be residing in the UK for an E2 visa application? Yes. So the, the UK is the only country for E2s where you are required to reside there, but the res residing there doesn't necessarily mean, so two extreme examples. One example, someone from the Cayman Islands, and they have, uh, this happened to us, has an e as a British passport, has ne never visited the UK, ineligible for an E2. Someone who lived in the UK most of their life, went to the US or another country for four or five years, um, and did so didn't live in, the e2, live in the UK at that particular point in time, they're probably still eligible. We'd have to look, but that they're probably still eligible. So the question is, uh, there, there's actually a blog post we have on this on our website you can take a look at. But the question is, um, uh, if you've never lived in the UK or if you haven't lived there for a long time or you only lived there for a short period of time and you, you know, you've been out for 10 years or something, then, then you would have to reestablish residency before you applied for an E2. Perfect. Um, Ian, did you say that I want to be mindful yeah. of, of the time? Yeah, so we'll take we do mm -hmm. one more question, Dustin, and then we'll... we'll sure. Yeah. Sure. Um, okay. So on average, how much revenue does an E2 business need to generate in order to support 10 full-time positions? Um, part of the reason I asked this one is it is related to another question we got, which is when you seek renewal of an E2 visa, does the government require you to show a certain number of people employed? Sure. And I think I'll focus more on the second question because the first mm -hmm. one it, you know, you could have a business that has that only makes $100,000 and could still be a very valid E2 business, a pool cleaning business that pays people minimum wage in Florida that has three employees could be a valid E2 business with $100,000 revenue. So the amount is never going to tell you very much. But the renewal with the renewal, you always want to have employees to renew. And at least our, our rule of thumb is that when you go to renew, if you have a visa for five years, a rule of thumb is really that you should have at least um, th three full time employees by the time you go to renew. Um, it's equivalent of three full-time employees by the time that you go to renew. Perfect. Uh, great. Well, so uh, that's all the time we have today. We really do appreciate you all taking the time to join us this, uh, for this presentation. Um, we do hope you can take part in our future webinars that are upcoming. And again, I'll send uh, that information to all participants on how you can sign up. Um, the next presentation will be on January 14th and we'll cover the TN visa. Um, thank you all again. Have a great day. Great. Excellent. Thank you. Bye-bye.